from Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. Vice President Lyndon Johnson <clears throat> has left the hospital in uh, Dallas, but we do not know uh, to where he has proceeded. Uh, presumably, he will be taking the oath of office shortly and become uh, the 36th President of the United States. I welcome this kind of examination. We came. And for the international order that we have worked for generations to build. A new world order. A new world order. You saw? If suddenly there was a threat to this world from some other species from another planet outside in the universe. I always talk to you like the other day. And then we're going to Washington, D.C. to take back the White House! He died. Yeah! He died. But that's a wicked woman. Because people have got to know whether or not their president's a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. You can keep it. Period. 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 They are the focus of evil in the modern world. It's a catastrophe. Deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome. This is the Midnight Rider News Podcast. Hello, America and the world. Welcome to the Midnight Rider News Show. I'm S.T. Patrick, your friendly neighborhood host, traipsing through the trials and travails that have so tempestuously and untruthfully been blasted into your eyes, ears, and minds by the state-sponsored talking heads, court historians, and textbook conglomerates that control information today. Tonight, we have episode 028, Joseph Green and the JFK Assassination. Our featured guest in the Midnight Hour will be Joseph Green, and as all of you know, in November we'll be doing JFK episodes because it is, again, the anniversary of the death. First, however, a little cleaning of the castle. We're on Facebook, at Midnight Writer News Show. That's at Midnight Writer News Show. Twitter, at MWN underscore ST Patrick. MWN underscore ST Patrick. LinkedIn, at ST Patrick. The email is MidnightWriterNews at gmail.com. And the free archives are located at MidnightWriterNews.com. Again, writer, spelled W-R-I-T-E-R, as in someone who writes. Now, I'd like to remind everyone that we're still available on iTunes and all your favorite podcast distributors. So even if you don't go to the website, you can still find us elsewhere. I want to say another hello to all the listeners joining us at AmericanFreePress.net. Now, I'd like to personally invite you all to check out our archives. We've had the pleasure of putting together some fascinating shows with some amazing guests whom we know you'll like. So please check us out and listen to our archives at MidnightWriterNews.com. And thank you for, for uh, reading us and listening to us on the American Free Press website. Thank you for being with us on the Midnight Rider News Show, and we'll be back with Joseph Green. On episode 005 of the Midnight Rider News Show, we were honored to have one of the leading JFK assassination researchers on the show. Jim T. Eugenio of KennedysandKing.com joined us to discuss his entrance into the JFK assassination research community, the case and trial of Jim Garrison, Oliver Stone's JFK, the poor JFK-related work done by Vincent Bugliosi and Tom Hanks, the 2017 JFK records releases, as well as comments on James Files, The Three Hobos, and whether he believes it was Rafael Cruz in New Orleans with Lee Harvey Oswald. Listen to Jim DiEugenio on episode 005 of the Midnight Rider News Show today. Joseph Green is a political researcher who's been affiliated with the Coalition on Political Assassinations and currently serves on the board of directors of the Hidden History Center and the Center for Deep Political Research. His work has appeared many times at kennedysandking.com, as well as in Ken Thomas's Steam Shovel Press, Russ Baker's Who, What, Why, and many other outlets. His new project is an intro to the JFK assassination conspiracy and will be available for Microcosm Publishing in December. Joe can be followed at JoeGreenJFK.com. And we're happy to have him with us tonight. Joe, let's start with what's been on everybody's mind recently, the JFK Records. What is the JFK Records Act of 1992? How did it come about? And what exactly is mandated by the act? Okay. Um, so I'm going I'm to tell the story as I know it. I wasn't there. So, you know, this is secondhand to some extent because I, I you know, know a lot of people who were there. Um, basically what happened is that JFK was a huge hit and I'm, I'm not sure that it's appreciated at this point 
to what extent it was a hit. It was the it was the biggest film of its year. It made, I, if I remember right, and I'm just this is just off the top of my head, but it was somewhere in the order of 300 to 350 million dollars in 1991, 92. So, um, it's sort of like if one of the Marvel films had been about conspiracy or Harry Potter. Like, that's how big this movie was. It was huge. Everybody knew about it. And interestingly, I think to some extent, because of the negative publicity before the film, um, I can't remember if it was Time or Newsweek that ran the article uh, about uh, Don't Trust JFK before the movie even came out. Uh, but I think that had something to do with how big it, it was. But anyway, it was. It, it was huge. And because of that, Oliver Stone had put a little um, card at the end of the film that said not all the documents have been released, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that seemed to shock people. I think most people were under the impression that, of course, because this was, you know, been almost 30 years, that obviously we had all the information in the public domain, and, we, and that, of course, turns out not to be true. So there was a lot of pressure that was put onto Congress to do something. Uh, by by the pop the people the people got got organized um, and in fact um, to some extent the coalition on political assassinations uh, grew up around that around the 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 push to get the files out so uh, Bush who was the president then had a lot of uh, had a lot of pressure put on him and the they were obviously they were not excited about this they were they did not want to release these documents but basically congress said look we got to do this the public is you know i got to i got to keep my job and so they passed something called the John F Kennedy Assassination Records Act or Records Collection Act i think it was called in 92 um and the press weren't still weren't very excited about it and a gentleman named Robert Gates who uh, should be very familiar to people who have investigated 9-11 in particular, um, was the head of the CIA. And he established something that he called the Historical Review Program. And the idea was is that the CIA would then review documents for release, um, you know, to say, oh, we, we can't release this for national security or whatever. But even with all that against it, and then uh, there was huge delays uh, Bill Clinton became the president and there was still not, I think it took still like about a year to really do anything. And then uh, finally there was the, the act called for the creation of a board, which turned out to be the assassination records review board. And the idea was is that it would go through the documents and release them. And there was a structure put out that it would release by certain, such and such a time. They'd have two years to do it. Um, it ended up being over 5 million pages, almost 6 million pages of documents. And the, the, the one difference, though, so, uh, but the HSCA, the House Select Committee on Assassinations, in the late 70s, they were tasked to reinvestigate the crime. The Assassination Records Review Board would, did not have that. They were not to come to any conclusion. Uh, probably because they had learned from the HSCA, because since the HSCA was a governmental body, when it concluded at the end that there was a conspiracy because of the Dictabelt recording, uh, they said there had to be at least two shooters, uh, they put egg on the face of the government. And in fact, to this day, technically, the last governmental body to render a decision about what happened in the Kennedy assassination was the HSCA. Now, the media pretends that didn't happen, and they always go back to the Warren Commission, but in fact, the government's position is that there was a conspiracy. So anyway, the ARB uh, uh, went through about six million pages of documents. Most of that stuff got released. Uh, some of it very badly redacted, some of it not, but a lot of interesting stuff got through. And basically, the most interesting books that have been written from 1998 to 2017, had used those new documents. Uh, Breach of Trust by uh, Gerald McKnight and the Diogenio books, several books that have come out that are very, very good. 
that um, concentrate on those new documents. Another interesting thing that happened around that time, and it's, I mean, I, whether this was done on purpose, or who knows, but Gerald Posner basically came back into the media to discredit conspiracy theories right around the same time that all this was going on. And it was like if there was ever, an, the media did its best to ignore what the ARB was doing, but when it did run an article, it tended to it tended to have Gerald Posner come out as a spokesperson to poo-poo the whole thing. And in fact, they tried to de- the the government a couple of times tried to defund it, and COPA, the Coalition on Political Assassinations, uh, actually spent a lot of time preventing that by getting the public de- keeping the public aware of what's going on, you know, just working very hard to keep it in the media, and um, and in fact. In around uh, 96, I think it was, uh, COPA, or 97, COPA also got interested in doing the same thing with an MLK Act. And John Judge worked for most of that last part of his life um, trying to get a an MLK Act together. Um, because I don't know if this is too off topic, but Dexter King had, okay, because Dexter King had met with James Earl Ray, the purported assassin of Dr. King, and Dexter and, and James Earl Ray said, I did not shoot your father. And Dexter said, I believe you. And at that point, there was some, the family, there, there's, there's always been a split in the family about whether or not to cooperate with that. I think they're afraid of, of what they might find, you know, in terms of the personal stuff with MLK. So they were never able to get that off the ground. Uh, but the JFK Act was a big success, really. Um, even though stuff is redacted, even though a lot of those documents were destroyed, uh, the stuff that get, did get through was some of it was extremely interesting and helped the historical record. So what is the process by which a document can be released, and how can an agency challenge a document's release? Yeah, so the idea is, is that they go through a, they have like a panel, and um, the guy who was the chair of the of the ARRB board was a guy named John Tunheim. Um, and there were several other historians and Justice Department people and um, some good folks that were involved in that, including uh, Doug Horn, who you've had on your show, was one of those guys, um, and David Montague, uh, who came to speak to COPA a couple times. Uh, some some good folks that were working on it. But they would go through a a person, a, a um, or sometimes a, a few people from representing the CIA or various intelligence agencies, and basically they'd look at a document. And they would get to decide, uh, okay, let's take out this sentence, yeah, yeah, not this sentence, you know. Um, and it was really, it was done at a very meticulous level. So they're able to, or they look at a document and say, you know what, we're not releasing this one. So like anything else, and I think even, um, you know, it's funny when Donald Trump said that he was going to, he was going to go ahead and allow it, which it's not really under his purview to allow it or disallow it. But anyway, that's another story. But when Trump said that, he said something like, absent additional information, we'll release the documents. And I think that's basically what he was talking about. In other words, unless somebody from the CIA or the Defense Intelligence Agency or somebody who doesn't want a particular piece of information to get out, then it won't get out. Now, the question I've been asked most the last week is what we've learned. What have we learned from the July releases and from the releases within the last week? Well, it's hard to say. Um, you've probably seen there was an article in the um, gosh, it was I think the Daily Mirror. It was it was in it was in an English newspaper about the phone call that took place. I guess about twenty five minutes before the assassination. The trouble is, is that I mean, and, and that's certainly very interesting. Um, also, in the news has been this uh, this note that J. Edgar Hoover made about uh, convincing the public, but the weird thing is is that is not a new document. That's a document we've had for some time, and I'm not sure why the news has seized upon that as a piece of new information. It's not a bad thing, in, in my view, because at least it's getting out and people are seeing that, but it's not something that's brand new that we just found. Well, for those out there who may not have heard anything about the call, let's explain the call in the UK. Okay, so apparently there was a... Um, a phone call that took place, and if I remember right, it was about 25 minutes the uh, 25 minutes before the assassination. 
and it said it was sort of vague, but it said something to the effect of, you know, there's going to be a big story. Like, you know, wait, look, you know, wait, wait a minute, and you're going to there's going to be this big story. Um, so it didn't say that you know JFK was going to be assassinated or anything like that. Um, it was something that you know MI5 got a call from somebody in um, I think it was Cambridge and said there's going to be some big news and call the embassy. So that's, you know, I mean, it, it, again, it's one of those things of, like, maybe that means something, but maybe it doesn't. I mean, obviously, if the president doesn't get assassinated, that thing, get, that particular call gets filed as a crank or was he even referring to that? I mean, who knows? And one of the issues about that I have about this is that, about the Internet age in general, is that we're required almost to present instant analysis. And you can see this, you know, with all the, there's kind of a race to look at the documents and say, okay, this is what we got, you know. And and that's, I think that's why some of the stuff that's been reported has been old information. It's actually information that we already knew. Um, I barely had a chance to really start going through the documents. And uh, I know, um, you know, John Newman's been going through them and he's been, you know, Whatever he finds, he sort of puts up and says, oh, this is interesting. But I would also caution, I would caution people on accepting somebody else's word about a particular document in general, even somebody like John Newman, because you, you, you almost, you, you got to do the work. If you're going to, at least if you're going to research, if you're going to write something about this, if you're going to try to understand um, what happened, you're going to have to go through these documents yourself. And the nice thing is, is that uh, I think they're still available. They were on the they were in the National Archives website. Um, I don't know if that stayed up or not. I know some people were having trouble with the links, but uh, but y you can download it. You can look at it yourself. But it's going to take time. It's it's when you start trying to instantly report on stuff is when mistakes get made. Now I believe it was our friends at JFKFacts.org that did some analysis, and what they had come up with was they said that it had sort of taken the focus off of the KGB and had put more of the spotlight onto Castro and the Cubans. Is that what you've heard also? Yes. Yeah, it, it does seem like that. And in, Well, although there's this interesting uh, kind of Operation Northwoods type document that talks about um, uh, killing people and blaming it on Castro. Um that's it, which I have not gone through. I've just seen. I just saw somebody talking about it, so I haven't read the the actual document myself. But it, it is that is interesting. But yeah, there seems to be that point, and that that makes sense. I mean, so there's been since the Kennedy assassination, there has been various uh, stories that the government has floated to sort of cover its butt, right? So initially, it was the Russia thing. Um, you know, the, even even people who maybe suspected there was something else. They would tell him, "Well, oh, look, we can't we can't let it get out." But uh, Oswald was a communist. He was sent here by the KGB. If this gets out, it's going to mean World War Three. You know, do you want World War Three? No. Okay. Well, then play ball. And then they, you know, they put out the mafia. The mafia did it. You know, be, uh, you know, uh, there was a lot of books written, mafia kingfish and things like this about, you know, the mob did it. Um, and then the, the latest, more recently, has been, uh, there's been a lot of stuff about LBJ did it by himself, and now we're coming back to Cuba. And if you, the, the most interesting thing about the Cuba is if, if you've ever uh, read what Castro said on November 23rd, 1963, the day after the speech he gave, it's an amazing speech. And Castro, has he has it figured out immediately. He says... They're going to blame it on us. <laughs> you know, this is this is bad. This is bad for us. Not just because we're losing uh, somebody who was trying to negotiate with us. As you know, um, you know, Kennedy had been sending a French uh, journalist to talk to Castro, and they had this kind of back channel communications going on. Um, Jean Demon, I think his name was. Anyway, um, so he knew that he was losing an ally, Lyndon Johnson's foreign policy with respect to Cuba was obviously not going to be the same as, as Kennedy, but he also saw that we're being set up, that it, that, you know, that's what's going to happen. They're going to blame it on us. And it's hard to take that stuff seriously. Um, cause we know that that's something that they would do. And even with this story coming out that they were willing to kill American citizens and blame it on Castro. These are, this is an obvious false sponsorship type situation. 
And it seems like the mayor in Dallas in 1963, Earl Cabell, had some ties that we didn't know about. Yeah, he was. He t- it turns out he was actually a, a CIA uh, informant, which isn't too terribly surprising. But it is one more sort of nail in the coffin uh, in that case because uh, his brother, of course, had been fired by Kennedy. Earl Cabell had been fired over the Bay of Pigs along with Richard Bissell and, and Alan Dulles. And so it was always a suspect that the mayor of Dallas happens to be the brother of somebody that Kennedy fired. One of the many, 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 you know, things that are hanky about the, that day. Uh, but yeah, to have this extra little piece of information, oh, by the way, Cabell was also a CIA informant. Very interesting stuff. The changing story of CIA involvement has interested me greatly here, Joe. Now, what I mean by that is that it, it's always been seen as a botched investigation by the CIA, that is, the investigation of Oswald. Now, with the work that Jefferson Morley and John Newman are doing, it seems like the CIA didn't botch the Oswald investigation at all. Rather, it appears that they meticulously controlled the investigation, right. and that James Jesus Angleton was a primary figure in that controlling of the Oswald investigation. So what are we learning about that? I, I mean, of the brand new documents, I haven't seen a whole lot about that. What With the, with the ARRB documents, there was a lot of interesting things uh, that came out. Um, one of the really interesting things, and I don't want to go too deep into it because I don't want to screw up the details, but f- f- one of the things that, that was known about Oswald is that he had attended this Albert Schweitzer College. So the, um, there, the, the FBI, if I remember right, and I don't, again, uh, I don't want to screw up the details, but basically the uh, FBI was trying to get information about uh, Oswald at one point, and he, he would, was going to Albert Schweitzer College which was this extraordinarily obscure college that they could they didn't even they didn't know what the hell the hell it was. They were like, what what the heck is Albert Schweitzer College? So even they don't know what's going on. And there's no reason for him to be going there. It's this you know, Oswald's backstory is so bizarre um, that you know, literally many, many books have been written on the subject and the details are they're they're too extensive to go into here. But you're right. I mean, it looks like somebody is, you know, either controlling or maneuvering Oswald into all of these different places in a very suspect way before any of this happens. And, you know, Oswald was, I think, 24 when he was killed. He had one of the most interesting lives that anybody's ever had in such a short period of time. Though this week was the final release for the JFK Records Act, now approximately 300 documents are still being reevaluated. Yeah. And a final date has been set for April 26, which is another 180 days. So why were some documents withheld and by whom? It's it's so bizarre. I mean, they've had 54 years to monkey with the documents, right? I mean, at the 11th hour, they got to redact some stuff? It's nuts. I don't know if... If there's, I mean, obviously there's still names that they feel like they have to protect. Um, some of it may be just bureau, bureaucratic stupidity. I mean, put that out there. That's always possible. But as to what they're protecting, that's a good question. Because, so one of the weird things about all of this, really, I mean, I, in a way I'm glad that um, that this has happened because JFK's death is in the media and being discussed to some extent, even if in a horrible way most of the time. But in reality, because um, my my friends and, and like my wife's friends um, have been sort of, oh, so what does Joe think about all this? You know, cause they, they know that I'm a researcher into this stuff. You know, so what, what do, and the thing is, we already know more or less what happened. You know what I mean? I, I mean, it's pretty clear Oswald didn't do it. So once you have that established, who's covering it up? I mean, why are we going through this process? I mean, th- those answers are obvious, aren't they? I mean, are we, are we covering up all this stuff because we're worried about the KGB? We're trying to protect the fact that the KGB sent this guy? Are, would the CIA be super concerned about documents implicating Castro? No. There's only one reason for the government to be upset and delaying after 54 years, the release of documents that should be uh, completely harmless documents, right? I mean, would think so. if you're the government, these should be harmless. These, should, these documents, should be, you should be able to hand them out to everybody, no problem. And you can't. Well, why can't you? I mean, the, the answer is obvious. So, 
I mean, I, these documents are going to fill in some gaps. We're going to get maybe some more details. Like the thing about Cabell being a CIA informant, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, the call to the UK about a you know big news, yeah, that's interesting. But is there going to be a smoking dung, gun document? No, but we already have a bunch of documents that are more or less smoking gun documents. I mean, at least from my perspective, you know, the fact that you know you're talking about the uh, the uh, the story of Oswald being laid out. The fact that J. Edgar Hoover knows who he is three years before the assassination and is worried that uh, somebody's using his name to buy guns in Mexico, you know what I mean? Like, that's already, that already blows up the government story, right? Oswald's not a loner. He's not, he's not a guy who doesn't have any friends. Yet. J. Edgar Hoover knows who he is three years before the assassination. Like, we're done. Like, so... I don't expect there to be a huge amount in this batch. I'm going to look at. I'm going to look through them because you just, you know, at this point, I'm pot committed. I'm going to, I'm going to look, I'm going to look through everything that comes out. Uh, but yeah, I don't. I mean, there's nothing. There's nothing that's going to say, you know, Oswald did it with the candlestick and the conservatory. <laughs> right now, I mean, if you really think about this, Oswald is killed at 24, and they knew what he was doing at 21. Now, I think of myself at 21. Yes. Joe, there's no telling what, what kind of crazy things I signed up for or said or did. <laughs> and the FBI had no concern whatsoever. So you're exactly right. Why did they care about Oswald at 21? Yes. Yeah. No, that's, that's exactly right. Um, the FBI did not care what I was doing when I was 21 years old. And it, do, it, it doesn't typically. You know, the, the fact that he was so young and obviously involved in all kinds of stuff makes you believe that he's laying a trail, or a trail is being led for him to Dallas. I mean, that's what it looks like. Now, we were talking before, and you have an interesting theory on what you believe and whom you believe. It's funny. My dad, uh, this morning, sent me this article from the Washington Post. Uh, it was called The Dossier and the Uranium Deal. It's about you know Hillary and the, uh, the dossier and Trump and all that stuff. And um, it was written by a guy named Glenn Kessler. One thing that's very important uh, for researchers in general is to find out who is who is giving you the information. Who are they? So Glenn Kessler, very interesting thing about this guy. He is the great grandson of the man who founded Royal Dutch Shell. His great granddad was actually born in the Dutch East Indies, and Glenn is a member of the Council of Foreign Relations because, of course, he is. He went to Columbia because they all go to Columbia. I, I call it the three C's. Anytime I see any, you'll notice anytime they invite somebody to talk about any subject on like uh, any news show, they went to either Columbia, to uh, the University of Chicago, or to Cornell. I always see those all the time. It was just interesting because when you find out who's actually giving the information, that tells you something about what's going on. And my dad's next question was may seem like a non sequitur, but I thought it was a good question. He said, what is Jeff Bezos' connection with the CIA? And Jeff Bezos, the same thing, right? Um, his grandfather worked for DARPA. So that's the Pentagon side of the world. He was also in the Atomic Energy Commission. And Jeff Bezos, without the CIA, would not have a business because Amazon actually lo was losing money hand over fist until the CIA gave them the contract to do cloud computing for them. Well, you're right, and your father's right. I mean, what is news if we're just repeating what spokespeople say, or if we're just repeating what people tied to the story say? I mean, what kind of journalism is there, and how important is the news? Yeah, and I mean, uh, uh, John Judge used to to tell the story that he got from May Brussel, which is that you know that these both John Judge learned how to cut up a newspaper from May Brussel. You know, she'd look at a newspaper, immediately cut out all the things that are pertinent and put it together. And uh, but they were complaining that by the 80s, uh, newspapers had gotten so bad that they were mostly worthless except for the society pages, because the society pages tells you who's hanging out with who. You know, I've never thought about it that way, but that's probably correct. Now, let's go back to the beginning. You're someone that is well and widely respected in the JFK assassination research community. So I want to know how you became involved. When did this case first draw you in? So I uh, grew up in this little town called Laredo. You can't go any further south 
until or you get to Mexico. Okay, it's at the bottom of Texas. And um, my dad was a history professor. And so I grew up around academics. And um, so it took me quite a while, actually, to get into the JFK thing, because if you are an academic, um, people do not talk about conspiracy theories. Like, there is no... I, I mean, there, there are vanishingly few academic publications that will get into anything like conspiracy theories. And so I saw the movie JFK... Uh, 1992, I think I was I was 20 years old. I was a kid uh, in university, and it made an impact on me as a um, film critic and as a as a person who loved film. Um, but it did not make an impact on my consciousness in the idea that hey, I should go look into this um, because one of the things that you learn in academia is basically to compartmentalize and to assign value to things and to categorize them. And so I came out of the, the film JFK and said, oh, that's a really interesting example of like a counterculture alternative approach to U.S. history. Not, holy crap, you know, they killed JFK. So it, it really wasn't until basically 9-11 um, or or just really just before 9-11, because what happened was I was living in Austin, and uh, this guy wanted to make an indie film about conspiracy theories, and he hired me to write the script. And he gave me a couple of books to read, um, one of which was Rush to Judgment, and the other one was um, John Armstrong's book, Harvey and Lee, which is not a book I would ever recommend anyone to read as their first book. Um, but it's an amazing book, but it's, you know, don't start with that one. Um, and then 9-11 happened a few months later, and I was probably in, in a kind of psychic shock, like a lot of people were for about six months. And then they started to realize, hey, wait a minute, this story makes no sense whatsoever. And then I started to connect it to the books that I'd been reading in preparation for this script. And I wrote the script, and the Money fell through for the production. You know, stuff like this happens all the time. So, anyway, so the movie didn't happen. But here I was stuck with this this thing that wouldn't go away. And so I started to do research in a big way. And then um, it all came to a head when I read an article by John Judge in a book called Secret and Suppressed called The Black Hole of Guiana that told the real story of what happened at Jonestown. And the article was so incredible. And one of the thing, things about that article is that one of the reasons I really responded to it is that it was written in an academic style. It was like a, you know, it's a 20-page article with like 160 footnotes. So I could find everywhere that he was getting the information. And a lot of that information was primary sources. It wasn't stuff that he had read in a newspaper. Well, I mean, it was, but it was derived from interviews that people had done from people on the scene and what the uh, coroner uh, Dr. Mutu, I think his name was, had said about the bodies and all that. So it, it, it measured up to those standards because, so one of the things I had seen in the several years that I've been researching is that there are some books that are written very um, off the cuff, will you say, in JFK research. And some of them try to measure up to more of an academic standard. And those are the ones I liked better, you know, because there, there are whole books written that don't have any footnotes whatsoever on JFK, including Bill O'Reilly's stuff which you can't trust at all. Um, so I went down to, uh, to Dallas because the Coalition on Political Assassinations meeting was happening. Um, I was, I'm always early to stuff, so I went there, I think, the day before that it was actually happening, and I uh, went up to the, the breakfast room at the hotel, and John Judge was sitting there. I sat down and said hi, and we talked for about three or four hours, and that was it for me. So not only was I a researcher and I was getting into all the stuff, but I, I became, like, John Judge became the focus of a lot of my work because I realized how much work that he had done and where he had come from. I really don't want to get too far off the JFK track at this point, but sure. I have to ask you, what did John Judge really believe happened to Jonestown? Oh, well, I mean, it's a long story, but the, 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 the simplest thing is that there are no suicides at Jonestown. And the fact of the matter is, is that the coroner said they were all murders. There are no suicides. The entire Kool-Aid story is made up. 
So, and that was staggering. But the thing that made it so staggering is that this wasn't a theory. John just read the accounts that came from the Guyanese reports. So the U.S. newspapers and the rest of the world was reporting something that the local press wasn't reporting. It was a complete, they had changed the story. And that was a staggering thing because all of a sudden, like this isn't a theory anymore. This isn't like, oh, well, maybe this happens or maybe there's a slant this way. This is just flat out, they are not reporting what happened. So this is a whole other thing. Um, so that I think that was the big breakthrough because it happened in in real time in a sense. Like I was I was I was my mind was sort of working all this stuff through. But you know, conspiracy theories have this. Um, you know, I wrote an article one time about how um, just the the term conspiracy theory is like profanity. And if you go back and look at the origins of the word profanity, it means to be outside the temple. And that's exactly what they are. If the temple is academia, which is the university, which was the prison by which my intellect was sort of built, you know, for the first probably 30 years or so of my life, then there was this, like, uncleanness that was attached to the. And I didn't really want to be a conspiracy theorist in the sense of the tinfoil hat guy with newspapers, you know, pasted up over the room, all those cliches. And when you talk to people about them, that's they're immediately where they go. They think, oh, you know, and, and you believe in Bigfoot and, you know, whatever. And this was not that. This was flat out. You, he could demonstrate that this story was a lie. And if they would lie about that, then what else would they lie about? Absolutely. So I think I saw Oliver Stone's JFK the weekend it was out in 1991. And then I think I saw it three more times. <laughs> Since <laughs> then, I think I've watched it in full probably 25 times or more. Yeah. What I'm interested to know yeah. is you also said you saw it then, but what's your opinion of it today? Oh, it's fantastic. I mean, I think the ironic thing about the film JFK is that actually it's one of the best historical films ever made. In other words, you can account for more things in JFK than you can account for in most historical films that are made by Hollywood. And, in fact, they, they really made an effort. Uh, Stone and, and Zachary Sklar really made an effort to try and put only true things into their movie. Now, when you're writing a script, uh, there are certain things where you have limitations where you can't include every single character. And what they did, they telescoped some of the events, and they made they combined several characters into one character, like the um, Kevin Bacon character and things like that. And so people attacked it for those things, but those are conventions of cinema. You know, you can't make a nine-hour film about this subject, so you have to telescope some of it. But as far as, like, comparing it to other films, like, it's brilliantly made, it's effective, it works to this day, and most of it is true. And why that's ironic is because that's the antithesis of what they said back then, of what the, the mainstream mass media said back then. Yeah. Which is, well, it's good Hollywood, but it's horrible history, which ends up not being true. Right. Well, it's funny. I mean, you know the, you know how that script got leaked, right? No, who leaked it? It was Weisberg. No. Weisberg is, yeah. Because, because he did not like Garrison. And he did not, he thought it was ridiculous to make Garrison the hero. And for those who may not know, who is Harold Weisberg? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah Harold Weisberg was one of the very first. Uh, Warren Commission critics. He wrote a book called Whitewash that came out in 66, I believe. It was, it was one of the first books. And, um, and he's, he's a, he was a very good researcher, um, not a great writer. His books are a little tough to get through, but they're full of great information. And he himself was pretty irascible sort of a guy, uh, kind of a grump that didn't get along well with people, didn't work well with others. Um, Although, you know, his, his, I have a bunch of his books, and they're, they're all worth reading. How did the script wind up in Weisberg's hands? Because initially, now, and I don't know the exact details of all the story, but when Stone was making the film, he reached out to researchers for help. Um, you know, like, for example, Mark Lane. And Mark Lane always complained later that um, he had, I think he said he stole my intellectual property because he had that scene with Mr. X, with Donald Sutherland, which is based on a conversation that Lane had with uh, Fletcher Prouty. Um, 
and and you know Weisberg was in the loop, and I forget exactly how this happened, but he he was the one who released the uh, he got a copy of the script and he released that early version. And I have to say, so um, again, not to get too far afield, but having been involved in the attempt to produce a film about the Kennedy assassination, um, there are a lot of researchers who don't want a film to be made unless it's the film of them. And I've seen that up close firsthand. There were pe- there were people that we tried to... So I, I'm, I'm, uh, Ryan Page, um, a director who has made uh, several documentaries and uh, been a film producer in Hollywood, contacted me several years ago to be a research and script consultant on a movie that he was making. And I got involved with that. And then in the course of making that movie, it was decided we would also make a documentary. It's a really long story. But we ended up making the documentary. The documentary has been has shown only one time. It closed the Dallas International Film Festival in 2015. And we've been seeking distribution ever since. But there's a lot of complicated stuff that went into that whole project. And one, hap- one thing that happened was is that the movie, the film that we were trying to make, that was attached to the documentary did not get made. And so there are, there are problems with that as well. But in the course of doing that, um, I, we ran into a couple of places where I was using um, researchers that I respected and liked, and those are the ones that I called when we made our documentary, and virtually all of them said yes. But there were a couple that said yes initially, but then when it turned out that the film was not going to be they were not going to executive produce the documentary. They f- they dropped out. So that does happen sometimes. One more question on Stone's JFK before we move on. Now, you and I are the same age as we discussed before, and mm-hmm. we saw the movie around yeah. the same time. Now, I want to know if you believe that the apex of the film is the same as I. I believe it's the Donald Sutherland X scene in Washington, D.C., yeah. which I think is perfect. Yeah. No, it, it's, it is. It's spectacular. It's um, and it's particularly uh, that's probably my favorite sequence too. Um, although some of the courtroom stuff is really good, there's a lot of really good scenes in that picture. Um, and the the John Candy scene is great too. But as far as watching it in real time in the montage with with a, such a well designed montage, and Donald Sutherland doing the narration, you really. It's like that moment, you know, and Kevin Costner's look at the end of that is the look you have when he's done with the montage. It's like, oh, you just you just put it together for me. You know, I get it now. It is. And Costner's great in that movie. You know, I, I'll, def- I'll defend Kevin Costner forever. I, I like that guy. Now, I've heard that doing the Stone movie turned Costner pro-conspiracy theory. He was, well, at, at one point when we were making the documentary, um there was apparently a deal for him to do the narration in the documentary. So for a little while, I was writing narration that was going to be spoken by Kevin Costner. Um, That fell through or something. I don't know. Hollywood's really weird, and I don't want to just talk about Hollywood for the next several hours, but uh, there's a lot of weird stuff that goes on. But, uh, yes, Costner was going to do the narration. I mean, one thing, because Oliver Stone is in the film. So I got to interview Oliver in his office in, in Hollywood. And he, it was great. He gave a great interview, and it's fantastic. And I want people to see it, and I wanted people to see everybody that was in the in, that was in the film because we got a lot of great stuff, um, including from like Dick Gregory who just died, and, you know, and John Judge who died. But uh, you know whether that'll happen or not, I don't know. But uh, but yeah, my understanding is that Costner has uh, has turned around on that, and that he is interested in the case. So, until about 10 years or so, I had no idea, one, how large the JFK assassination research community is, but two, that there was so much contention within the community itself. Now, I was wondering if you knew the origin of that, yes. um, when it started, with whom did it start, and why do you think it has become so personal today? Oh. <laughs> uh, we could talk about that. Um, so, the, the origin of the original split, you have to think about it in terms of the the first people who started really researching the case there were pe- 
there were people who thought the whole thing was hanky on November 22nd, 1963. And then when Jack Ruby shot Oswald, uh, there were a lot of people who said, holy cow, you know, this is a coup d'etat. One of those people was Vince Salandria. Vince Salandria immediately saw what was happening and immediately started going to work on it and researching it. Um, but there were a lot of other people, too. Uh, Ray Marcus, uh, a lot of folks that people maybe don't know, um, Penn Jones and uh, Sylvia Marr, they were all working on it individually. And gradually, over, over a period of time, they started to run into each other. And the, the story is very well told in a book by John Kellen called Praise from a Future Generation. Um, the only thing he doesn't have in that book is that he doesn't have anything about May Brussel, which is, which is unfortunate. Because uh, May Brussel, you know, we could talk about her for the next several hours. But so, so they, there were all these people that were working on it. They were all doing their own specific work. And then Garrison happened. Garrison, it became public knowledge that Garrison was, was trying to prosecute a case against Clay Shaw in the, uh, you know, and researching the, the JFK assassination. And there was an immediate split among the researchers into pro and anti Garrison, um, groups. So there were some people who decided to help Garrison, like Vince Landry, for example, and there were people who thought that uh, either, you know, that Garrison was a buffoon, that he was incompetent, which Sylvia Marr had no use for Garrison whatsoever. And Sylvia Marr's book, uh, Accessories After the Fact, is one of the absolute best books ever written on the case. She's terrific. And she made a, an index that everybody still uses uh, because, incredibly, the 26 volumes of the Warren Commission had no index. But that was the beginning. That was the beginning. Where when people really started taking sides was was with uh, when Garrison happened, and I, part of the reason was is that there was a feeling that there was no way Garrison was going to successfully pr prosecute this case against Clay Shaw. First of all, there were people who didn't believe that Clay Shaw was even involved. Um, Garrison was vindicated on that later um, when it turned out that he was in fact a CIA contract agent. But at the time people didn't necessarily believe it, or maybe that, that Garrison had picked the wrong guy to prosecute this case, and the worry was that Garrison was actually going to solidify the case against Oswald by failing to make the prosecution. And in the public's mind, if Garrison screws this up, that it's over. We're never going to get a chance to, to do this again. And I completely understand that. You know, Had I been alive during that time, I don't know which which way I would have gone. I mean, I can see the merits of both positions. I think ultimately uh, Garrison's case was actually really good for us. Uh, he turned up a lot of great leads, including 544 Camp Street, which is, you know, that's one of the keys to the whole case. But I understand when people said, you know, this is, um, this is going to screw things up forever. And that has continued on to the present day, not just about Garrison, but about whether the Zapruder film has been altered. Um, whether Judy Baker is the real thing. And I, I have to say that I find most of that stuff a sideshow. And uh, Vince Landria called all of that sort of thing a false mystery. That's what he called his book. He said, look, we need to focus on the aspects of the case that tell us why it happened. We already basically know what happened. I mean, you don't need a ton of evidence uh, at this point. Like, there's, the CIA is about to release a bunch of documents, which, okay, they've had, you know, 50 years to mess with their documents, but whatever. We'll, we'll look, we're going to go through it, we're going to we're going to read them all, and we're going to figure it out. But having said all that, we know Oswald didn't do it, right? I mean, I, there's, there's, Oswald didn't do it. So, arguing about whether the Pruder Prim was real or fake, or whether, or whether Judy Baker's telling, I mean, okay, Judy Baker's telling the truth, great, let's move on. You know, who cares? Because we've got stuff to work on. There's there's real there's real things we should be doing. And I and I'm not I'm not saying you shouldn't investigate the case. Far from it. The detail work has to be done. But we can't get obsessed with one thing and make that our thing and that's what we work on forever. And we say, Oh, you know, if you don't agree with me that there was surgery done on the head, then the hell with you. And that's what the community tends to do. They tend to split up into all these different factions. And probably it's just human nature. You know, I don't know.
Well, yes, there are so many things. I mean, the man in the doorway, the prayer man, the badge man, Mac Wallace in the Texas School Book Depository, the South Knoll Theory, oh, on God. and on and on and on. You know, yeah, that's all. And I sort of think yeah. that those arguments are all yeah. valid, and going through the details, as you said, has value. Right. Now, it sort of starts as a hobby, though, and then for many it progressed to an occupation, and so now, you know, livelihoods are on the line. But then it becomes a lifestyle, and when that happens, I think every detail becomes vital to that person. Yeah. So we break up into factions because, well, you know, that's what human beings do, yeah. and then we organize with like minds. Yeah, no, I, I, that's, that's right, and, and I'm as guilty of it as others. I mean, there are, and it, it's different, too, when you're, you're sort of in the research uh, milieu and you're going to conferences and things. You know, there are some researchers that I think are very fine researchers who I cannot stand as human beings. <laughs> I mean, I just, you know, I can't work with this guy. And on the other hand, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, we can do that. Um, I, you know, it's funny. Well, this one's public, so I, you know, it's already known. But, um, but I actually told this story recently publicly, which I had not told before. Which um, the guy uh, Phil Nelson, who wrote uh, the two LBJ Mastermind books. Um, I reviewed the first one of them for um, what was then Sitka, what is now Kennedy's and King. And, uh, you know, I gave it a bad review. I didn't like the book. He responded by going onto Amazon and giving one of my books a, a terrible review. And in the course of doing so, uh, told me, well, my book is, is outselling you by a vast amount. You know, you started going into what my Amazon ranking was. And it just <laughs> I thought, Wow. So we're going to talk about whose Amazon ranking is is uh, is higher. That's interesting. So last year I was I was in Dallas and um, I ran into uh, to Ed Tetro. I was I was actually I um, attended very briefly the Judy Baker conference because my friend Richard Bartholomew is a good friend of mine. Uh, we are publishing his book. He's great, and so I was there just to see him give his talk, which was amazing. He, took out a big bat and started hitting stuff with it. And, uh, and I was like, oh, man, this is, this is great. And so, uh, so he, we came out, and, and, uh, and Ed Tetra was there, and uh, Ed is a good friend of Richard's. And sort of uh, Richard has a kind of relationship with Ed that I have with, uh, that I have with John Judge. So Richard went off, and I was, I was alone with Ed for a while, and he proceeded to, to chew me out about the review that I wrote about Phil Nelson. And basically his point, there are some things that he said that I cannot repeat because he told me not to. Uh, but I can say that one of his major points was that Phil was an outsider, that Phil was not a research guy. And he came in and he wrote a book that he felt had a lot of good stuff in it. And I had just, you know, killed it, which actually I, I you know, upon reflection, I thought that's that's a pretty reasonable point. And I have nothing but the utmost respect for Ed Tetra. I mean, as a researcher. So I kind of thought, okay, fair point. I still don't like his book, and I still have the same issues with the book, which is that sort of the first third of the book is Robert Caro, and then the next two-thirds of the book is him desperately trying to prove that LBJ did it. And it's not that I don't think that there are Texas connections to the Kennedy assassination. In fact, the book that we're publishing is all about the Texas connections to the Kennedy assassinations. It's called The Deep State in the Heart of Texas by, by Bartholomew, Richard Bartholomew. And it's terrific. And it's a lot of really interesting stuff. So I'm not saying that Texas is not involved as a venue and that there weren't people that were involved. But I don't, I don't think that you can reasonably make the case that Lyndon Johnson was the guy directing everything. And, it, and he didn't make it. I, mean, I know he doubled down. I, have, I never read the second book. He doubled down on it and he said, you know, I think it's called like From Mastermind to Colossus or something like that. But, you know, uh, it, and that's fine if that's if that's your thing. And from a marketing standpoint, I know that has hurt me as a writer. I have several things that, that hold me back. Um, one thing is that I, I write about too many different kinds of things. But the other thing is, is I am not a LBJ did it guy or a Pentagon did it guy or I don't have like a little a quick thing that you can attach to my name that says, oh, you're that you're that dude. I, I just don't have, yeah, I don't, I don't have a, a little handle that you can attach to me and says, oh, that's, Joe Green is, you know, the guy who believes this. Well, Phil Nelson was on our show a few weeks ago, and um, I actually thought he was great. Yeah, yeah. And he was nice. He was extremely nice, actually. And he'll be on again in January to talk about his two LBJ books. And, 
yes, I do think he's more of an LBJ guy in general, or, or actually an anti-LBJ guy. And I think that has some yeah. real value to LBJ was a dirtbag. Yeah, I'm not right, defending right, LBJ right. at all. Yeah. And he wasn't no. necessarily the only one to go after LBJ in the yeah. JFK community. I mean, there was Roger Stone, for example. Uh, Zer- Craig Zerbel, and there's been a bunch. And then the original was the a, Tex- a Texan Looks at Lyndon. Well, and I think my point is that these contentions are very real, and they're very personal. I guess the one thing that I would ask you, well, for example, let me say this. I can sit around a table with a bunch of guys, and one can say it's the mob, one can say it's Castro, one can say it's Russia, and we can all sort of joke and laugh and uh, you know exchange ideas, and it's no big deal. But in this community, it seems like that's not always the case. It is very personal, oh, yeah. and I guess oh, yeah. the question I would ask you is why. Well, because, I mean, it's, it's hard to summarize that. You need a, you know, I'll write a novel someday and put this stuff in, because... The, the thing is, is that everybody has personal histories with everybody else. So it's not just, not always, I, I shouldn't say it, but it's not always just, I disagree with your thesis. Um, sometimes it's, I disagree with your thesis, and by the way, you really did this to me in 1994 or whatever. Um, there is some of that in there. But yes, there are, there are definitely... Uh, lines of contention about certain things. And there, there are things, like for me, for example, that go back to, I used to help John organize the conferences all the time. And that means that I was constantly running around trying to get people who don't, who don't like speaking for like 30 minutes or an hour, they all want to go over their time, you know, <laughs> they all want to take Q&A, even if we don't have time for Q&A, I got to get this person off. And I got somebody from you know, Italy that's scheduled to talk and I can't, you know, I can't phone them or, and then I have somebody from Ireland that's coming, you know, coming via Skype or whatever. So I've had to deal with that. And so there are certain, uh, researchers that are very easy to deal with in those situations. And then there are some that are not. And when you get to see that firsthand, that colors your, how you see the rest of the research. So I want to ask you that now, you know, I don't want to go back into who is hard or who is a really, uh, Mm -hmm. a really hard case, but I want to ask you who's affable. Who do you really like to deal with in this community? Um, I loved working with Bill Turner all the time. Um, I really, really liked that man. Um, and of course he died recently. Um, I wrote an obit for him for, um, for who, what, why. And, uh, Jim Mars was always very, easy to deal with uh, very nice very nice man who else peter del scott is lovely paranoid but lovely um <laughs> uh, you know most most of the researchers are absolutely fine the ones that stick out which i won't say because <laughs> there there are some that i really really dislike because of things that happened in the course of events at, at the coalition of political assassinations but you know and of course the ones that i work with on a you know everyday basis, you know, like my buddy Dave Radcliffe with the uh, Hidden History Center um, is always a dream to work with. And that's why I work with him on a more permanent basis. So, like, I'm associated with the Hidden History Center and the Center for Deep Political Research with Jeff Worster and Richard and Randy Benson. And, and um, you know, these are these are people that have become friends over the years because we, we do a lot of stuff. Uh, yeah, they're they're all very very pleasant to deal with, and that and that matters, and that matters. And I'm also in a in like a I call it the sewing circle, you know. I'm in an email circle with all these these people, including Vince and and you know Marty Schatz and people like that. And they're always so incredibly polite and nice. It's it's nice to be able to send messages back and forth and talk about current events and things. And everybody's extremely respectful of everybody else's opinion. And they're such high level guys, you know, Ed Curtin and these, I mean, I, I'm, I feel like, you know, I'm the kid that's allowed at the grown ups table, you know, at these email, because all these people are like, you know, have PhDs and they're much more accomplished in their field than I am in mine. But that's always nice when people can be basically polite and respectful. And I have to say, um, I shook hands with Phil Nelson last year. Uh, he did. He, it was, it was pretty hilarious. Cause Ed said, you know, Hey, uh, hi Phil, this is, uh, yeah, this is Joe Green. <laughs> and Phil kind of shook my hand. I was like, oh, God. And uh, But, you know, he was, he was perfectly polite and, you know, you know, he had no issue. Well, that's, <laughs> that's nice to know because I obviously like you both. So, you know, I really think the thing is that people just put so much time into their work that they're very protective of yeah. it. Yeah. And when it gets attacked, obviously we strike back. And 
I think that's understandable. Oh, it is. It's completely understandable. I mean, you know, I, I, I get it, and I, I, I try to take that into account, and I don't write a whole lot of negative reviews of stuff. I mean, um, if I typically, if I don't like something, I just won't write anything about it. You know, or if I really, or if it's just where I think, oh God, you know, this thesis is junk, I'll just say, okay, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna write about that. But you know, if I'm assigned a book, like because every now and then, you know, Jim sends me something, he says, hey, you want to do this, and I'll do it, and then, you know, I, and then I read the book, and either I like it or I don't at that point. But I'm already committed. So what are you gonna do? Now, I'll ask you the same thing that I've asked others. I understand academic opinions and all of that, but the bad guy here, to me at least, is the mainstream media, not someone else who you may think is on the wrong path with their own research. Am I wrong? No. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, and you can tell, because it's it's funny, because there are actually, if you look at JFK research, there are a ton of academics. You know, Mark Crispin Miller, Michael Parenti, Peter Dale Scott, uh, you know, and then people like Cyril Wecht and Gary Aguilar and David Mantic, these are very high-level guys. But, like, Michael Parenti is a good example. He's had this kind of um, gypsy career because of the fact that he takes a lot of unpopular positions. You know, and, and if you're an academic, you are much more at risk than you ever were probably in the last half century, well, really since McCarthy, to take unpopular positions. And not just in conspiracy, but on a whole host of other things, too. There's this kind of this kind of rise of the um, of a conservative right wing mentality that's disguised in kind of liberal tolerance that's going on in, in in universities in general. But there's definitely this this thing about again getting back to you're not going to be able to publish stuff if you're trying to write a book for a, uh, a university press. You can forget it. I mean, you're going to write about Lee Harvey Oswald not shooting JFK. Forget it. You know, there's no way that's going nowhere. You know, David uh, Talbot broke through with a very, very good book, the uh, Alan Dulles book, which is terrific. And he's, but he's already, because he's, he's already has such a prominent place as a journalist, they couldn't ignore him. They had to deal with it. Um, so that I thought that was a great breakthrough. A lot of people got, got a chance to read that. He got reviews in places that normally our sorts of books don't get reviews in because of who he is. Now, you'll soon be releasing an intro to the JFK assassination conspiracy from Microcosm Publishing. So please tell us a little bit about Microcosm Publishing and what we can expect. Okay, so um, so this story starts with my, with, with my wife. Um, uh, my wife is Dr. Faith Harper. She's a trauma therapist, and she writes a column for, mag- for several magazines. And She got the attention of Microcosm Publishing, which is this outfit out in Portland, and she started writing zines for them because zines are back. They you absolutely know. are. Yeah, I mean, when I was you know when I was a teenager, zines were basically you know punk. Uh, they were mostly about music, you know, punk and new ways. Oh yeah, you know, they were great, you know. And, uh, and you know, for a kid from Laredo trying to hear about Joy Division, you know, you, you probably can find it in the zine more than anything else, you know. But uh, so she started writing all these zines. Well, her zines just absolutely they're, they're blowing up. And so they said, well, you need to write some books for us. And she wrote this book, and her book is blowing up. And anyway, so um, I we went to Portland, uh, I guess a month ago it was, so she could sign 5,000 books that are all going out, and we could do some various things. And I got to talking with the uh, the publisher, and we were talking about And the publisher is a guy named Joe Beale, and he's interested in this stuff and has been for a while. And he has this series of zines called The CIA Makes Science Fiction Unexciting. And so as we started talking, uh, he said, do you want to you want to take over the series? You want to do some some stuff? And I said, sure. And so um, so I had sent him one, uh, I guess, last year called the Conspiracy Fun Book, which was done. It was basically a joke. Like uh, Faith and I were messing around. And I said, you know, you should do it. She said something like you should do a, con- a fun book about conspiracy. So I did. So it has like a word search. But, you know, who killed President Kennedy? But you can't find Oswald's name in the word search. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so stuff like that, and uh, and so that did okay. So they said, "Well, why don't you go ahead and do an, an introduction to uh, to the Kennedy assassination?" I thought, "Great." So, so I put this out, and it's going to be on a zine. It's coming out in December. It's like three bucks. Um, but the really great thing about it is that um, it's mostly young folks that like this, and they really like this zine format. And so it's written. The thing is written more informally than I would have written for like. 
you know, an article for, for Jim DiGenio or something. But it's still, there's a lot of substance there, hopefully. And it also, it talks about the larger forces that are involved in the Kennedy assassination. I, I finished writing it, and then I realized that I had not mentioned the words grassy knoll at all in my introduction. And I thought, well, gosh, should I say something about that? And I decided, no, it kind of speaks for itself on its own. Like, if they want to look up the stuff about the grassy knoll, I include references that if they want to get to that stuff. But what I was really interested in talking about was kind of the the larger forces that are involved, political analysis of what happened and why, rather than a lot of the detail about, you know, where the shots came from and stuff like that. They can get that anywhere else. Um, so anyway, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. It hasn't come out yet. Well, we can't wait to read it, and we will absolutely advertise it on the show and the site. It sounds exciting. Now, Thanks. other than your own work, what are three JFK assassination books that mm-hmm. someone new to the case must read? Well, three is hard. Um, in the zine, I gave seven, I think, um, which is which is not too bad. It's not too bad, but it's, it is hard to, because there are so many books that are that focus on specific information. Like if you're if you are a JFK researcher. I think you have to have Vince Palomero's books, right? But they're not general interest books. They're, they're very specific. And they're and if you pair them with certain other books, they really, oh, yeah, now this makes sense. But they're like later on. Like they're, the, they're not your intro, intro 101 books. So you got to go further. I think my books are like that, too. My books are not written for entry level. And I'm hoping the zine will fix that. But what I, what I put in there was, now for a young person, it's hard. There's actually a little teeny book called The CIA's Greatest Hits uh, by Mark Zepzauer, I think it is. And it's a tiny little book. It has, like, illustrations in it. I think that's a pretty terrific book to give a teenager. I think that would, you'd say, oh, my gosh, and maybe start, you know, picking something up from that. Disinformation used to put out these little books called uh, 50 Revolutions That You're Not Supposed to Know About. Things like that. So that I think that's really, and I but I love the disinformation books. I mean, those are great. Um, I, don't, I don't think Russ Kick is doing them anymore, but they, they were terrific when they were existed. So it's hard on that level. But just as a general reader, the things that I recommended in uh, in my zine are um, uh, False Mystery by Vince Landry. Uh, the nice thing about that is that you can read it online. Dave Radcliffe edited and put together a new online version a false mystery uh, earlier this year that I helped with a cover and a few footnotes on. I didn't do a whole lot. Um, Ratcliffe did all the work. And then uh, Max Good, who's making the film about the pains, contributed um, his interview that he did with Vince last year or the year before. And uh, Dave Starks, great guy, who contributed an interview that he had done with Vince back in 1998. So it's a really terrific thing. I think Michael Morrissey gave material. Marty uh, Schatz did. Uh, so it's a great thing, great book to start with. And then, of course, JFK and these people, I think, is terrific. Um, I don't necessarily agree with everything he says, but it's really beautifully written. I would say the Dulles uh, biography that, that Talbot did is up there now. Um, I always recommend people read, uh, especially at, at first, even though it's a huge book, uh, Into the Nightmare by Joe McBride. Uh, and the reason is, especially for... Um, uh, I would I I try to get my dad to read it because I thought this is a book that will really make sense to him because Joe was uh, he met Kennedy when he was about 12 years old or he was in the same room as Kennedy when he was about 12 years old and he um, he actually what am I trying to say he he was uh, promoting Kennedy he was um, carrying leaflets and things like that uh, before he was elected and he had a real um, affection for Kennedy before anything any of this stuff happened. And so the book details what happened to him and his journey of accepting what the media said about it and then figuring out that it wasn't true. And then what was he going to do about it? Because Joe McBride became a media figure himself. Uh, you know, he's writing for The Nation magazine. I don't know if you know this, this story, but Joe McBride is, is a good friend of mine, but also just one of the most interesting people ever. You know, he's written about Orson Welles and Steven Spielberg and he... He's uh, in the last Orson Welles film, and he wrote Rock and Roll High School with the Ramones. And he's he's, he's ridiculous. He's he's a very very he's a super interesting dude. But uh, but I really like his book. His book takes you on that journey. And then as a researcher, you know, he has this really interesting interview with Jim Lovell. Uh, he got to people that nobody had ever spoken to before. Uh, you know, Tippett's father, 
a lot of interesting stuff. Um, really goes through the tippet. And in fact, when we were making our documentary, we, f- we flew Joe out to Dallas so that we could walk the tippet shooting. And so we went we, we, we went on a tour of the tippet shooting with Joe McBride. Um, and we did the same thing with Grodin and Dealey Plaza, you know, taking these little these little t- mini tours. So yeah, I think that's a great book. And then I tell you at the end, you you really need to read Jim DiEugenio's books, particularly Des- Destiny Betrayed and Reclaiming Parkland. And I say that my only warning to you is that if you read these books, you're going to end up owning 50 JFK books. And I really don't think um, I, I, I don't know how. Uh, widespread the admiration is for those books I, I, because they are really staggering. They are really good. Um, in, in particular, the the um, the information in, in Destiny Betrayed. There's little tidbits, you know, about um, which I didn't know. Like Harry Truman had written uh, an article about the CIA that got published 30 days after the assassination, where he's warning people about the CIA's. That stuff is just, and they're and they're like on every page. There's something that's just holy cow that happened, uh, and then reclaiming Parkland, just taking apart, doing what I felt was uh, a great service to all of us because I only got through about 200 pages of Bugliosi's nightmare, but to have a guy of Diogenio's caliber actually read the whole thing and then tear it apart is just fantastic. I mean, because I wouldn't have done it. I I was just like, oh my god, I can't read this crap anymore. Uh, but he actually, you know went through it which somebody had to do which which is great so yeah i think that's i think that's all but those but there's tons of good books there's tons of you know and there's there's tons of really horrible books as well and i think even Uh, the books that are not as well liked or not as popular we can always take a chapter or a paragraph and learn something from them too yeah that's what joe mcbride uh, was always telling me you know because he he used dale meyer's book and i thought oh my god but there was some things in it that he can that you can use and, you know, explain why Dale Myers is, what the deception is. And I think that's that's useful as well. Now, seeing that you've been into the Hollywood scene for a while and you've had experiences going through the process, I was wondering about this Harvey Weinstein story. Now, we've heard a lot about it. We've heard that, you know, a lot of people knew, but everybody kept it under wraps. And I was wondering what your experiences were and if you had any stories. Okay. okay. So, the other thing that you learn when you work in Hollywood is how malevolent, I guess, it really is. Um, my personal experience was, it was weird. It was the, um, you know, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Um, I frequently didn't get paid, um, although when I did get paid, it was nice. Um, I certainly didn't get paid back the value that I put into what we were doing, and maybe that'll change. Who knows? I mean, because the, the documentary could get distribution. Who the hell knows? But I guess it's like anywhere else in that there are good folks and bad folks, but the bad folks are really, really bad, and there's tons of open secrets about people. Um, there was a director that... I knew of that was, uh, oh God, I, I probably shouldn't say this. The point is, is that um, a lot of things are accepted in Hollywood if you can make a successful picture. Um, and it is as badly um, skewed towards men as all these women are saying. Um, for example, one of my first ideas when I came on board was I when I read the script I said you know the the, the female part isn't great um, do you mind if I punch this up and they're like no that's that's fine and I said because well maybe we can re- we can write a great woman's part because that that doesn't happen very often and we can get a big female star and and you know everybody's looking at me like I'm an idiot because that's not how it works the the male star gets a voice on who he has to, who he gets to work with. So when you get your male star, the male star has input on the, the woman, the, the female lead. And I just was, uh, I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. You know, I was like, I, I mean, I, I, I mean, and I knew some of these things, but to be faced with them up front. And there's even more, um, 
even just in a normal Hollywood production, there are things that are pretty skeevy um, that I felt uncomfortable about when they're talking about how things operate. Um, which I don't, I don't want to get too much into detail about that stuff. But I think the reason why it bothers people, I mean, stories like the Weinstein story, is that every Hollywood um, yes. movie seems to be sort of a moralization tale. You know, it's it's a tale where you have these characters who go through the story, and you're supposed to learn something. And the learning something usually involves a moral yes. of some kind, or at least an idea that the film is trying to teach you. So when they see Hollywood hiding behind all these, uh, for lack of a better phrase, immoral actions and immoral people, the idea of hypocrisy just seems to be raging. So do you have any thoughts on that? See, I I, I don't know about that. Um, the, the reason I don't is because the, the, the way a Hollywood film works, right, um, it goes out to so many people that there's going to be some message that is transmuted in that film, right? No matter who was in charge of making films, you would always say, oh, they have an agenda. But what they really have is they're telling a story, and that story has certain values attached to it. But the difference between that story and a story that I might write tomorrow is the fact that, you know, 100 million people are going to see it. So I'm not I'm not 100% sold on that. And And here's the thing, too, is that, it's divided up into different things. Like, um, like I'm a writer. So if I'm writing something like a play or a script or something, the only thing I care about is making it a great play or a great script. And everything that I'm doing is to, to make it be what it is. And there are certain narrative tricks and there's like a structure to things that will help you to guide you to make this work. But, I am not thinking about a political agenda when I'm doing it. Um, it has to do with the work. And I think most most writers are like that, and I think most screenwriters don't really give that much of a crap about politics. A few of them may, but I don't, I don't really think that's the issue. Um, you know what I mean? So... And and there and actors act for different reasons too. I mean, act, there there may be actors that suddenly become political or start out political or all that. But mostly, what actors want to do is they want to be in successful pictures. So you are a man involved in a lot of things, Joe Green. So tell us a little bit about the organizations in which you take part. Oh, good lord! Um, well, um, I belong to three. Uh, I'm on the board of directors of three organizations. Um, one is the. Um, the uh, the local San Antonio Pride Center, which is an LGBT plus group, um, but uh, which ends in December. Uh, I've been there for a little bit over a year with my wife and just doing local work. Um, and then I belong to the Hidden History Center, of course, which was which grew up based around basically John Judge's material after he died. Uh, we wanted to preserve it, and so it, it became the Hidden History Center, which is located in York, Pennsylvania. Uh, the person who does the most work on that is Marilyn Tenehoff, who was uh, John's partner when he died. And then, of course, Dave Ratcliffe, who runs the website, and, you know, I do what I do. And then uh, the Center for Deep Political Research, um, which is basically a think tank at this point, and it's run by Jeff Worster. And uh, and like I say, uh, we, we uh, have Richard in there and, and uh, Randy Benson as well. And, um, you know, the, the the idea is to try and make inroads into our collapsing civilization here in the United States in terms of those things. Um, and then I, I also, I write plays, uh, had a few produced. Um, I've written a few scripts, although nothing that's ever made it, uh, I've, you know, for films that didn't work. And, and of course I was involved in the documentary with, um, you know, with Oliver Stone and Richard Belzer and all those folks. Uh, which I'm very proud of, and I think it's great, and I hope that someday people will get to see it. And um, and then I was a research consultant for uh, Randy's film, The Searchers, which uh, the way he explained it to me was, um, you know, I would he said, you know, that you remember that time I uh, I sent you a text at two thirty in the morning and said, who's this guy? And he sent me a photo, and, and you said, oh, it's Bill Colby. He said it for it was for stuff like that, <laughs> uh, you know. So it's uh, 
Yeah, yeah, I, I love Randy. Yeah, yeah, he's 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 the best. So yeah, that's that's kind of kind of what I do. We all, I'm also uh, my wife and I have a publishing company that we started. And we published her cookbook called The Revolution. Will include cookies, and uh, she's a certified nutritionist. My wife is everything. She's like, she's incredible. And then uh, we published John Judge's book, uh, Judge for Yourself, which I basically edited his his old material. And uh, we put that out, and all of the proceeds, every time somebody buys that, sends some money over to the Hidden History Center, um, which is cool. And Dave and I are talking about doing another one. Um, we have enough stuff to maybe edit out another John Judge book, which would be, but I'm thinking 2019 on that thing, because i got a, I got a million things sitting on my plate right now. And I'm also uh, writing a uh, graphic novel that's, that Microsoft Publishing is going to come out with, and that will... That will cover – I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to put all the stuff that I haven't been able to put into my articles into this story. So I'm pretty pretty excited. My, my plays tend to have – my plays are a little bit wilder than things that are – that I, I can fictionalize certain things and put it into art and that way get that material out without necessarily getting myself into trouble. And if there's anyone out there that wants to read more about you or find out about your work, how can they do so? Uh, Joe Green JFK is the um, is the website, and um, it's I'm in the middle of a big change actually. I'm, I'm, I I I uh, rebranded my site basically. So I've been um, when I first started out writing and writing articles and things. Um, I'm interested in all kinds of stuff. I mean, I studied philosophy and movies and music and. All this stuff. So I like writing about all those things. And I like books like the disinformation books that have articles about all kinds of different things. I, that's, I, I just, I love the format and the old steam shovel press where you get, you know, 20 articles. And so my books are like that. So it means that you will be reading an article about, uh, you know, the anti federalists and then something about Martin Luther King and then, you know, something about the movies which I like, but it's hard to market. And then I chose dissenting views because my whole life has been spent disagreeing with people. Um, you know, and so it made sense. It was always like, oh, God, what's Joe talking about now? You know? And so it made sense, but unfortunately, dissenting views is, very, is also very hard to market. Um, people can't spell it. They can't remember it. They can't. So anyway, so Joe Green JFK, simple. Um, so hopefully that will that will uh, help out because I, I know it's, it's been an issue in the past and I'm finally learning enough about sort of marketing and things to, to do this correctly. At least we'll see. And this has been Joseph Green, JoeGreenJFK.com, the author of the upcoming introduction to the JFK assassination conspiracy. And hey, Joe, thanks for being on tonight. Oh, you bet. You bet. It was great. I'm S.T. Patrick. This is the Midnight Rider News Show and we'll be right back. What did the CIA know about Lee Harvey Oswald, and why did they keep it secret for decades? Who was James Jesus Angleton, and how did his hunt for a mole within the agency change the hunt for JFK's real killers? Hi, this is Jefferson Morley, author of CIA and JFK, The Secret and Assassination Files, and the upcoming book, The Ghost, The Secret Life of CIA Spy Master James Jesus Angleton. If you want to know what was contained within the CIA's files and Lee Harvey Oswald, as well as the role James Angleton played in the Kennedy-era CIA, listen to episode 14 of Midnight Rider News Show and visit jfkfacts.org today. Well, the JFK records are out, at least most of them. The rest will wait until April, or at least April. The most asked question has been, what will we learn? The mainstream media has basically told us that they're worthless. It's much ado about nothing if there isn't a smoking gun contained within. Except they know there won't be. So yes, they think the JFK files are a worthless exercise in bureaucracy. To the researcher, however, they're vitally important. As Joseph Green said tonight, we already know what didn't happen. It wasn't Oswald on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. We know that. At the very least, the House Select Committee on Assassinations said it was indeed a conspiracy. What the newest records will do is important as well. They will add dimensions to characters, stories, and agencies that we already know. Imagine the spark notes to the Grapes of Wrath. That's what we had after the Warren Commission. Researchers from Mark Lane to Jim Garrison, from Sylvia Marr to Mae Brussel, from Joe Green to Jim D. Eugenio, from Jim Mars to Peter Del Scott, 
from John Newman to Jefferson Morley and everyone in between, from Black Op Radio to Brent Holland to Chuck Ocelli to Midnight Rider News. We're all trying to turn the spark notes into a novel. I hope you all enjoy the first annual JFK Month. Stay tuned for more. From the other side of the mountain, on the best side of midnight, I wish you peace. The Midnight Rider News Show with S.T. Patrick is a production of MidnightRiderNews.com. Copyright belongs to S.T. Patrick and all rights reserved. You can email us at MidnightRiderNews at gmail.com. And be sure to visit MidnightRiderNews.com for the best in alternative historical analysis. This is Leanne saying thank you for listening. Have a great night. And always remember, when life throws you lemons, throw them back and demand chocolate.